Hello YouTube. As we all know, the only authority in Islam is the anonymous guy lying to you in the YouTube and Facebook comment section. These are the people that really know Islam. We cannot trust the Quran, we cannot trust the Hadith, we cannot even trust the ultimate authority in Islam, which is the Sharia. Well, I went and had a look and I discovered that the major authorities of Islam, the major scholars that founded Islam and the Sharia, oddly enough, do not get advice from those anonymous Muslims in the comment section. They don't phone them. They don't ask them for advice. They, I don't think they have the email address and telephone numbers, to be honest. Even Islam QA, oddly enough, does not consult anonymous people in the YouTube comments when they offer their fatwa, their authoritative fatwa about Islam. They actually use rulings from the Quran, the Hadith, and the Sharia. Shocking, but true. Shocking but it is true. They actually rely on Islam's authoritative texts. So taking my example from Islam QA, I want to have another discussion about Jihad. We're going to have a look at another book written by another very, very famous Islamic Mufti, someone highly trained in the Islamic sciences, someone trained as an Islamic scholar and as an Islamic religious authority and how he misunderstood Islam and how he did not go to the YouTube comment section and ask those incredibly knowledgeable anonymous Muslims for their advice. He actually went to an Islamic university. Shocking again, again, shocking. He didn't go to the YouTube comment section and check with that anonymous guy who constantly lies in the comment section. He went to an Islamic university to get his knowledge and education. I don't know, I, I don't know. So uh, I'm gonna just go with that. I think it's a good idea. Let's start with this man, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. I looked up Grand Mufti of Jerusalem on Bing, went to images, and this is what I got. This is him with Hitler. This is him with the Nazi SS. This is him saluting, giving the Nazi salute to his Nazi SS troops. Right over there, we have another one. That's him checking the troops. That's him, I think, with Heinrich Himmler of the Nazi SS. That's him shaking hands with, oh, that looks like Adolf Hitler. This is him having tea with Adolf Hitler. This is him having, oh, that's Heinrich Himmler. Yeah, so this is the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, who was a general in the Nazi SS. He volunteered for service with the Nazi SS, and he raised the largest Nazi SS division called the Hanjar. This is them. This is the Islamic symbol and the sword of Islam, the sword of Muhammad. That's them, the Hanjar. You can see their symbol right there. So yes, they volunteered, they fought in Europe, they slaughtered Jews by the ton, and they also fought against the British and the Americans in North Africa. So he raised tens of thousands of Muslims to fight, and he also then urged them to fight against the West. So yeah, this is the fantastic example of an Islamic Imam who somehow misunderstood Islam. Again, again, it's, it's shocking. If YouTube had been around then, if the YouTube comment section had been around then, he could have been consulted with those Muslims who know everything about Islam in the comment section. He would have been, they would have put him right immediately. But for some reason, he again studied at an Islamic university and got Islam completely wrong. Shocking, but true. So this is the 13th Waffen Mountain Division, and that's him over there. Um, yeah, this is some of these guys. That's their death's head over there. You'll see that. Good, good Nazis, good Nazis. But we're going to talk today about Muhammad Malana Masood. Azhar. He's a Pakistani Imam trained in Islamic sciences. Apparently, again, he was incredibly knowledgeable of Islam at a very early age. And uh, this man wrote a book on jihad. And we want to have a look at his book on jihad and what it says and see if it agrees with the uh, common sentiment. Sorry, I meant to say lies that we are told by uh, those liars in the comment section. Obviously, missing terrorist, 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 terrorist. And he founded a group called the jaish e muhammad terrorist group. Hijacking, jaish e muhammad parliament attack, Mumbai attack, Patan Court attack, Purwarma attack, up to 2019. Busy guy, busy guy, busy blowing things up, busy killing people. Mulana Masood Azhar, chief of jaish e muhammad India's enemy number one. And uh, yeah, there you go. So let's have a look at this man's book. Now that we've had a, just a cursory introduction to this man, let's go have a look at his book, which might tell us more about him and about jihad. In this case, we're going to get, just as I showed you with Ibn Taymiyyah's book, which is based on the Sharia and conforms completely, as I showed, with the Sharia in terms of its definitions of jihad and its application of the doctrine of jihad. We're going to look at this and see if this differs in any way. And you'll find that this is identical. The book is called The Virtues of Jihad. I will leave a link in the description, download a copy, read it for yourself. And we will discover that maybe jihad has nothing to do, or very little, if anything, with self-improvement 
this man is talking about murder. And the murder here is of anyone who is not a Muslim. He references quite often the Kanzul Umal, which is a Hadith collection which has not yet been formally translated into English to my knowledge, but he has translated a number of these verses and he uses them in English in this book. The subtitle is The Shortest Path to Paradise by Mulana Muhammad Masood Azhar. Let's have a look at the back cover. Who do the Kafirs fear? The hearts of the Kafirs are burning with hate and animosity for Islam, but they are frightened and scared stiff of the fundamentalists, the extremists. It says they're not scared of the Muslim leaders because they know that these leaders could be bought over a goblet of alcohol. But the Kafirs fear only the blasts of those bombs. Bombs used in Israel, bombs used in India, bombs which have shocked nations. And of course, the Kafir, that's non-Muslims, are afraid of those Muslim youths of Europe who openly stroll the streets of London and Paris wearing military clothing. They are scared of, and they speak here of the Mujahideen in Russia, and they are scared of those who raised the flag of the Jihad against the then Tsarist Russian Empire. So Jihad goes way back, even in the West. And also, they are disturbed with the thought of those unknown Mujahideen who forced the Americans to pack their bags from Somalia. They are frightened of those Muslim daughters, women of Jihad, who somehow transport weapons to the Mujahideen in Kashmir, Palestine, and Bosnia. I wonder why they wear those uh, burqas and niqabs. Maybe they're hiding things in them. Who knows? You never know. All Kafirs fear the word of Jihad. It is our duty and responsibility to revive this forgotten obligation of Jihad. I'm going to read perhaps the first 10 pages of this so that we can get a solid understanding of, again, a second exegesis of Jihad, which complies entirely with the Quran, with the Sunnah, with the Tafsir, and especially with the Sharia. So we can see how the top scholars accurately represent that Jihad is violence, it is warfare, and it is also, it is a state of war, and it is all manner of warfare against non-Muslims to establish Islam. Yeah, and we non-Muslims simply have to comply. It is to force us to comply, it is to terrorize us until we submit to Islam. And we either pay the jizya as dhimmis, as third-class citizens or semi-slaves, and pay them tribute. We are killed. Or, of course, with those non-Muslims who are not people of the book, they can convert or be killed. Allahu Akbar. Yeah, my God is bigger. Apparently, the proper word for greater in Islam is kabir. That's what I read somewhere. And Akbar means greater. This refers to the pagan worship where they had the rocks, the stone idols. That's why there's a black stone idol in Mecca. And it is our God is bigger. As in, we have the bigger rock. Our rock is bigger than your rock. We Muslims cannot renege in our responsibility and should make haste to join the army of Allah in the struggle to elevate Allah's word and the implementation of the Sharia. Should I call that the diarrhea from now on? Because it's, yeah, diarrhea. This book will provide sufficient information to motivate and urge the believers towards the obligation of jihad. The term obligation is a legal term. It means a legal obligation upon the Muslims. Let's look through the index of the book, The Virtues of Jihad. There is no deed equivalent to jihad in Islam. The Mujahid is the most superior Muslim, the most superior in devotion to Allah, wishing for children so that they may become Mujahids in the cause of jihad. The reward of spying in jihad. I wonder if any Muslims are spying, if they're in government, perhaps spying for Allah. The purchasing of weapons for jihad. I thought you would be buying, I don't know, salads so that you um, overcome your uh, compulsive eating. I thought it's about helping little old ladies across the street or uh, you know, things of that nature, but it seems that helping little old ladies could require weapons, you know, driving, there's some dangerous drivers out there. You might need to blow up their cars or, I don't know, put out landmines to slow them down a little bit so you can get that old lady across the street. You never know. You never know. Glad tidings of fighting against the Jews. In any book on jihad, <laughs> disparagement of Jews, the discussion of Jews as evil is never far away. I should actually do a video about the the very dim view that Islam takes of Jews and forces, that view is forced upon Muslims. It forces Muslims to hate Jews. They hate Christians too. They hate all non-Muslims, but they are taught to hate the Jews especially. It discusses the order to fight and to take a pledge of allegiance for death. Yeah, way to go. Islam, religion of peace, religion of peace, taking pledges for death. 
Let's have a look. Abath the author, born in 1968 in a religious and knowledgeable household. He was admitted into the Islamic University of Benoritan because he showed excellence from an early age. And he studied under great scholars such as the Mufti Ahmadur Rahman, a well-known figure in Pakistan, and Mufti Wali Hassan, the Grand Mufti of Pakistan. Interesting. He was well known in the Madrasa University for taking first place in class and in competitions. Quite the smart boy. And this took place at the time when the famous jihad of Afghanistan was taking place. One of the leaders of the jihad came to his university and Muhammad Masood Azhar wanted to participate at this man's suggestion in the training course of jihad, which he did. And then, of course, he decided that he would then spread the teachings of jihad because this trip changed his life. And he wanted this spread throughout the whole world like any other obligation of Islam. By nature, a kind and modest person, he eagerly wanted to take part in the front line of jihad. And then in the front line, he was injured in the left leg by the Russians. He went to hospital, he came out. And within a short period, he was renowned as an international speaker on jihad conveying the message of jihad to Africa, Europe, and the Arabian Peninsula. Thousands of people have participated in jihad after listening to his speeches. And he says here, O Hindus, do not think that the Mujahideen are weak. If you will shoot one bullet, the Mujahideen will answer with a rocket launcher. Even though he was captured, he continues and his people continue to propagate the work of jihad. One thing that he is very, very happy about is that, inshallah, you will learn very soon that the Nalim is ruling Kabul. This saying has proved true as we are seeing a true Islamic state in Afghanistan. This was the time of the Taliban, a true Islamic state, a true state under the Sharia. It was, as you know, brutal. It was ugly. This is the kind of world that he wants to bring about. Moving to page six, please download a copy, read this for yourself. He speaks of the definitions of jihad. Now there is more than one definition of jihad. The literal definition of jihad, derived from the word jud, which means to make substantial effort. Jihad itself has been defined in the Arabic dictionary as to make the utmost effort to attain something beloved or to save oneself from something dislike. However, jihad is a legal term and here they define it in shari or sharia terms or diarrhea terms for more accuracy. The scholars of fiqh or law jurisprudence have agreed that jihad in shari terms means to fight in the path of Allah or anything aiding this fight in the path of Allah. A more detailed understanding of the term jihad has been explained by the four major schools of Sunni fiqh as follows. We have the Hanafi school, the Maliki school, the Shafi'i school, and the Hanbali. Number one, Hanafi. Jihad means to be involved in fighting in the path of Allah by one's life, one's wealth, and one's speech. Yeah, having more salads could kill you. I guess that's what they mean. B. It is further explained to call the unbelievers towards the true religion of Islam and to fight against them if they are unwilling to accept Islam. Well, there you go. That's in the Fat al Qadir. That's Hanafi Fiqh. That's from one of their law books from their major scholars, according to this. And yes, it means to fight against us if we do not become Muslims like them. Maliki Fiqh. The Muslims are to fight with the Kafir to advance Allah's religion. Shafi'i Fiqh. The meaning of jihad in shari terms is to make utmost effort in fighting in the path of Allah. Hanbali fiqh. Jihad means to fight against the unbelievers. Religion of peace. Say after me, religion of peace. The ruling of jihad. Imam Saraksi states, Jihad is obligatory and commanded by Allah. Any person who denies jihad is a kafir, and people who doubt the obligation of jihad have gone astray. From the Fat al-Qadir, page 191, volume 5. Saibul Iktiar states, Jihad is an ordained obligation, Farida. One who denies it is a Kafir. The obligation of Jihad has been clearly substantiated in the Quran and Sunnah and by the consensus of the Ummah, called the Ijma. And you can find that consensus essentially in the Sharia. That's in Fatul Qadir, page 191, volume 5. They speak of different types of Jihad. Offensive Jihad and Defensive Jihad. Let's look at the legal definition of Offensive Jihad. This is when Muslims launch an offensive attack. Note, offensive attack. If this attack is on the Kafir who have previously received the message of Islam, then to call them towards Islam before commencement of the attack is considered preferable. Note, it is preferable, not compulsory, not obligatory. If the message of Islam has not reached them, then the Kafir will be invited towards Islam. If they reject the true faith, then they will have to pay the jizya, the Kufr tax. If they refuse to submit to the payment of jizya, then the Muslims are to fight against them. Let's look at Quran 9.29. 
fight against those who have been given the scripture, who believe not in Allah nor the last day, until they pay the tribute readily being brought low. Fight those who do not believe in Allah and who do not adopt the religion of truth. Fight until they give the jizya willingly while they are humbled. Fight those who believe not in Allah nor the last day, nor acknowledge the religion of truth, even if they are people of the book, that's Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. That is in the Quran, that is verse 929. And what you're seeing here is entirely in keeping with the Sharia definition of jihad, and this is an exegesis from one of the major scholars, modern scholars of Islam. This is entirely accurate. To read that verse literally is correct. The people on Facebook, the people in uh, the YouTube comments, they're simply either misled or they're just plain out lying. This is the correct definition of Islam. So the offensive jihad is fard kifaya. It is a communal obligation. It is compulsory upon the entire community of Islam. A certain number of them have to ensure that the kufar remain terrorized. Thus, the message of Islam can be conveyed without obstructions. If one group of Muslims fulfills this obligation, then it will be sufficient on behalf of all Muslims. But if no Muslims fulfill this obligation of jihad against the kafir, then everyone is considered sinful. Once again, this completely complies with every single authoritative reference that I've provided so far in all of the work that I've done every single Sharia manual, every single major scholarly work. This one is no different. I'm going to stop here. Thank you for your time. Please do support us. Linked in the description. Like, share, subscribe, pass the word around. If you have questions or comments, please put those below in the comment section. Download the books, read them for yourselves, share them, learn from them. Learn how you're being lied to and deceived by scholars, by major news organizations, by just people in the comment section, and by quote-unquote atheists, Islamic atheists, quote-unquote Christians, Islamic Christians, quote-unquote peaceful Muslims, just liars, just liars the lot of them, right? And they can no longer claim to be mistaken or uninformed because they've been informed. The information is there for them to use. They should read their own Sharia manuals. The rest are simply just lying to you. They want you to be unprepared while these people are actually making effort because jihad is not just about kinetic warfare. It is all forms of warfare from spying to political intrigue and more. Anyway, thank you very much for your time. Hope you enjoyed this. See you next time.